You may remember a movie that came out in 2019 about a book that was originally released on Wattpad with the male love interest molded after the King Harry Styles himself. Now, everybody under the sun shitted on this movie because it was objectively bad. And I actually completely forgot about the series until my friend texted me and was like, hey, the last movie of the series is being released on September 13th. And I was like, last movie, how many are there? There are five. Do you know how insane that is? Five movies in five years, a five in five? Now, at this point I felt it was my obligation to watch all five of these movies so that y'all don't have to. And I will say that the ending of this franchise is not what I expected. But in order to dissect that, we need to start from the beginning. First of all, the movies are based off of these books that are written by Anna Todd, which unfortunately I have not read, so I don't have that insight, but there are four books that follow Tessa and Hardin's love story. These are the two main characters. And there's a fifth book actually called Before, which focuses on Hardin's life before he met Tessa, a little bit more of his POV, stuff like that. I hadn't seen any of these movies until I watched them just now for this marathon and Oh my god. The first movie is called After and it starts with a line from my girl Tessa. My life before him was so simple and decided. And now after him, there's just after. Yeah, after he gave me a fucking aneurysm from his tomfoolery. In the next scene, we see Tessa in her room wearing an infinity necklace. Oh, please, dear God, no. Not the infinity anything but the infinity, no! Nah! Tessa is going into her first year at college and she drives up to said college with her mom and some dude that I assumed was her brother until they kissed on the lips. Apparently, there are no incestual relations going on. That is, in fact, her boyfriend, Noah, who is a senior in high school. Tessa and Noah's vibe, it's, it, they're very much good Christian kids. They dress very modestly, no drinking, drugs, or otherwise scandalous activities. Her roommate is the complete opposite though. We've got drinking, drugs, tattoos, piercings, the whole shebang. And she is actually the one who introduces Tessa to Harden, so thanks for that, girly, thanks. Basically how that meeting happens is Tessa goes to take a shower and leaves her clean clothes on the dirty ass bathroom floor. They inevitably get wet, so she has to re-enter her dorm room in just a towel where she finds Harden laying on her roommate's bed a book. So naturally she's like, who the fuck are you? Get out of my dorm room. And he's like, don't flatter yourself, babes. <laughs> I'm not looking. Then a few days later, I'm assuming Tessa's roommate invites her to a party. She meets the rest of the friends, gets peer pressured into drinking, and then plays a game of truth or dare. She first gets asked about the craziest place she's had sex and she like doesn't answer. So everybody's like, oh my God, are you a virgin? Y'all, Calm down, my girl is like 17 or 18 at the moment. She'll get plenty of action later, don't you worry. Then she gets dared to make out with Harden and he approaches her in what I'm assuming is supposed to be a, like a sexy way, but it quite frankly is terrifying to me. So he goes up to her and he's like, do you wanna do this? But then she's all like, I'm done playing this game. Later, she winds up upstairs in Harden's room and they almost kiss, but then she's like, no, I can't. That's right, girl, you can't. You you have a boyfriend. Later on, Tessa coincidentally ends up meeting this guy named Landon, who is Hardin's soon-to-be stepbrother. And it also turns out that Hardin is filthy rich and the son of the chancellor of the university. Then one day, Hardin seeks Tessa out in this coffee shop and asks her to go on this little trip with him. And she says yes for some fucking reason. And they end up in the middle of the woods. Every girl's dream. It's totally not creepy serial killer vibes. He leads her to this lake and he's like, fancy a swim. So they have a swim and a little heart to heart. He asks her why she's with her current boyfriend and she's like, well, he's nice to me. Setting the bar real high there, Tessa. Then he replies, isn't that another word for boring? What? I realized something in that moment. The ones that love Hardin are the Conrad Fisher people of the world, are the Edward Cullen people of the world. You have someone that's possessive, violent, needs to be fixed, but hey, they're hot and rich, so why not? Bitch, the only qualification for your boyfriend is that he needs to be someone that's nice to you, and Hardin doesn't even manage to do that most of the time. They end up kissing in the lake, which makes Tessa officially a cheater by most standards. They go out to eat afterwards, and they're having a little conversation, and Tessa says like Hardin, if you don't believe in love, which is something he said earlier that love is only like a transactional thing, then why do you read and have so many romance novels? And his response to that is, don't believe everything I say. That's another thing I hate about these guys. They always say shit they don't mean because they're trying to protect the girl or push her away because they feel like they're not good enough. Correct. 
You're not. Transaction over. Then Tessa and Harden get into a fight where he's like, there is no us. I don't date. And she's like rightfully bamboozled because she's like, well, I thought, I thought there was something between us, Harden. And then to spice things up, it just so happens that the next day, Tessa's boyfriend Noah shows up on campus to surprise her. They all attend this bonfire party. Harden ends up uh, fighting with someone because he is in fact jealous. He does in fact want there to be an us. Contrary to what he said before, but <laughs> don't believe everything he says. Noah ends up sleeping over in Tessa's dorm room, but uh, just before she's about to go to bed, she gets a call from Landon and he's like, girl, you need to come over right away. So she does. The house is in shambles and Hardin is out drinking by the pool. And you know, it's partly because of Tessa, partly because his dad is getting remarried and he's having a hard time with that. They start talking. He breaks the bottle he was holding in a fit of rage and Tessa starts picking the shards up with her bare hands. When she inevitably gets hurt, they go upstairs to bandage her up and end up hooking up. Then the next morning she wakes up in Hardin's bed and she's like, uh oh, I left Noah back in my dorm room. So she rushes over. He's already outside waiting for her. And when he sees Hardin, he puts the pieces together and he's like, oh my God, this bitch is a cheater. And he breaks up with her. Eventually Tessa and Hardin start dating and it was all going relatively well until her mother walks in on them. Then Tessa and her mom get into a fight. Tessa's mom is like, you need to break up with this boy. And she's like, no, I'm done being perfect for you. And then her mom was like, fine, bitch, then you're cut off. I'm pretty sure like there's a lot more to this relationship that we're not seeing in the movies between Tessa and her mom. We really only see Tessa's mom encourage her to get good grades in college and not cheat on her boyfriends, which are two very reasonable requests. Luckily, the one good quality about Hardin is that he's rich and has mad connections. So he manages to snag this beautiful apartment because he knows this professor who is away in Italy for the year. And so Tessa and Hardin start living together in this apartment. I swear it's the longest year I've ever fucking seen because they're in this apartment for like three movies straight. Later, they go to Hardin's dad's wedding reception where Hardin's major daddy issues are partially revealed. And then the big bomb is dropped. One of Hardin's friends tells Tessa that the only reason that Hardin pursued her in the first place was because of the game of truth or dare from the beginning of the movie. She took this as the biggest betrayal known to mankind. I don't know, if that were me, I don't think I would have particularly cared because girl, he is spending 24 seven with you. He's living with you. He secured you free housing. He wouldn't be doing all that for a dare. But anyway, after that, she like basically cuts Harden off. She goes back to her mom and makes amends with her and also her ex-boyfriend. She gets this amazing internship at Vance Publishing. Um, through her connection to Hardin. Then her English teacher gives her the essay that Hardin submitted because he basically like wrote it for her or whatever. He wrote how their souls are the same and how he was consumed by her and all that jazz. Then we have the second movie, After We Collided. Y'all, I wholeheartedly, unironically, give this movie a 10 out of 10. Maybe I'm too deep in the afterverse to see clearly. I don't give a shit. This one is a banger. Anyways, immediately you could see that the budget is way higher for this movie. They took the quality up a notch. Hardin's narration starts out by saying that Tessa is free from the bonds of her oppressive parent. See, that's what I mean. Shit like that, it seems a bit much for what they've shown between Tessa and her mother and their relationship. I will say that the relationship between Tessa's mom and her ex-boyfriend is a bit weird, but whatever, we'll move past that. Hardin and Tessa haven't spoken in a month. She is currently working at her internship with my man Dylan Sprouse who plays Trevor. He's a very no-nonsense nerdy kind of guy and I love him. He and Hardin single-handedly carried this movie. So Tessa, Trevor, Vance, head of Vance Publishing, and Kimberly, who works with Vance, but they're also dating. The four of them go to the club. Tessa gets drunk and ends up calling Hardin, which worries him, so he gets her location and immediately starts heading over. Meanwhile, Tessa and Trevor go back to their hotel. She ends up spilling wine all over him and has him strip naked, which is exactly the moment that Hardin barges in. Fucking Trevor! Trevor leaves, Tessa and Hardin have sex. When they wake up though, Tessa regrets it. They have a big argument that ends up spilling out into the hallway where Hardin walks out of the room butt ass naked and Tessa ends up grabbing this bread roll and throwing at him while screaming fuck you before raw dogging it down the hallway. Then it's Tessa's birthday. Trevor, he, he brings out the big guns. He ends up helping her buy this like used car. He did all the financial calculations. What a sweetheart. Then she goes back to her apartment where she ends up finding the kid that Hardin got her for her birthday. Then Hardin and his mom walk in and this is actually the first time that she and Tessa are meeting. I thought you were gonna be covered in tattoos, green hair and a piercing on your bean. 
she thought Tessa was going to have a piercing on her bean. He was supposed to go to England to see his mom, but she ended up visiting him in like a last change of plans. And he also never told his mom about he and Tessa's breakup because it would make her too sad. So Tessa agrees to pretend to be in a relationship with Harden, but they have to share the same bed, whatever will happen. Then Tessa goes back home to see her mom and she ends up running into Noah who spills the bean, who lets the cat out of the who ends up telling Tessa that her dad came to see her and her mom chased him off and Tessa ended up being mad about this because she hasn't seen her dad in like eight or nine years and she would have liked that opportunity to talk to him. So then she goes back to her apartment with Hardin where she and his mom have a little heart to heart. Tessa tells her that Hardin ended up lying about something really important and then she goes, well, is he sorry? Excuse me, bitch, but sometimes sorry doesn't cut it. No babes, no. I don't know how to do an English accent. Sometimes it turns out like I just, you're gonna have to bear with me, babes. <laughs> because Tessa opened the Kindle without him and he didn't get to see her reaction, he gives her another gift, which is the perfect day. He's like, Tessa, tell me what you want to do in your perfect day. And she says, I want to go ice skating. And that, that scene was hilarious. Do you want me to get you a walker? You're doing great. Fuck no. <laughs> they also did acro yoga, um, had hot shower sex where I was jump scared by a shot of Hardin's bare ass. Landon and the fam invite Tessa, Hardin, and his mom to a little Christmas celebration. Landon's mom became black during that time that we didn't see her. A lot of the actors in this franchise change, by the way. I'm not exactly sure why. Seeing his dad is tough on Hardin though, so Hardin gets drunk and punches him. And then his mom leaves and Tessa gets offered a position in Seattle, which she is highly considering taking. Hardin is a mess, but then he ends up starting to get his shit together. And then the two of them end up deciding to go to this New Year's party where Tessa and Molly, who was the girl that originally told her about the whole truth or dare scandal, they get into a full on brawl. And then Tessa and Hardin get into a fight because she didn't tell him about Seattle and she thought he was hooking up with another girl. So she goes back to the apartment while he falls asleep at the party. When he wakes up, he gets a ride home, starts calling Tessa. Tessa's also driving though, so when she goes to pick up the phone, she gets into a car crash. He happens to see the aftermath as he's driving by and starts running after her. I know this movie is called After We Collided, but I didn't expect there to be an actual collision. Trevor is at the hospital with her, so when Harden calls, he picks up the phone and he says, shut the fuck up and listen to me. You're toxic and you're bad news with his hand on his hip all sassy-like. So then Harden decides to actually listen to him and he disappears for like nine days straight, doesn't communicate with Tessa at all. She's worried out of her mind when she gets back from the hospital. Then there's this party at the publishing company, uh, Tessa and Trevor attend, and it's at this point that Trevor's like, hey girl, so um, Hardin actually did call when you were at the hospital and I told him off, so sorry about that. And then to spice things up even more, Hardin shows up at the party. Turns out he went all the way to London and back, but in the end, Tessa and Hardin end up getting back together and Trevor misses the opportunity to swoop in because he was giving himself a pep talk in the bathroom. I only pull out my teal suit when I have something important to say. Occupied. Then at the very end of the film, when Tessa and Hardin are going for a little walk in the city, this disheveled looking man comes up behind them. Hardin thinks like he's some sort of homeless man attacking her, shoves him against the wall, and Tessa takes a good look at him, and it turns out that this man is Tessa's father. The next movie is called After We Fell. Is she gonna like fall off a cliff in this one or something? I mean, I know she's gonna fall onto that dick. A thing to note about these next three movies is that very little drama of interest goes on, which is why uh, these recaps are going to be short. Basically, it picks up where we left off. Tessa's dad is on the streets, an addict, and so Tessa invites him to their home to stay. The big conflict of this movie is that Tessa wants to go to Seattle, but Hardin doesn't, but they don't wanna break up or do long distance. She ends up actually deciding to go to Seattle without Hardin, and he takes this um, time to start bettering himself. They are both slaying the game separately until Hardin has a dream that Tessa is having sex with somebody else, so he goes to Seattle to visit her to make sure nothing of that sort is happening. He ends up telling her about the dream, they have a lot of sex when they reunite, and then it turns out that Hardin's mom is getting married, so the two of them go to London. However, while staying at his mom's place, in the middle of the night, Hardin wakes up and goes into the kitchen and sees his mom 
and Vance having sex on the kitchen counter. Now obviously this is super scandalous because this is the night before his mom's wedding to another man and Vance is engaged to Kimberly with a child on the way. But the even bigger shocker of this movie, at the very end of the film, it's revealed that Vance is actually Hardin's biological dad. The next movie is After Ever Happy. Hardin does not take this news well at all. The dude who he thought was his dad had this like drinking problem and that's the main reason why Hardin had such a bad childhood. But it turns out that the reason that the guy started drinking in the first place was that he suspected that his son was not his biological son. Which means that the secret has single-handedly ruined Hardin's life. Hardin breaks into the home that he grew up in, starts burning it down, but then Vance comes to the rescue and takes the blame for it when the cops show up. Hardin starts going back to his old ways. He wants to party and drink with his English English mates, so Tessa goes back to Seattle by herself and finds her dad dead because of an overdose in her apartment. This like snaps Harden out of whatever he was going through and he goes back to Seattle to be there for Tessa and arrange the funeral. But this whole thing actually makes Tessa realize that she and Harden need some major time apart, so she moves to New York with Landon. Meanwhile, Harden graduates from college and starts getting help with his alcohol addiction, starts going to therapy. Five months later, Harden goes to visit New York and he and Tessa end up getting back together again. Then Tessa finds this book in his bag. It's a book that's about all of the trials and tribulations of their relationship that Hardin wrote. And it turns out Hardin has been writing this book all this time since the moment they first kissed. And can you guess what this book is titled? After. I know, such a full circle moment. But Tessa gets really mad at Hardin when she finds this because she's like, you wouldn't show me what you've been writing all this time because he's been like writing in this little diary all this time. But you go ahead and publish this book without my permission and spill all of the tea, air all our dirty laundry for all these people to see, like what is wrong with you? So then she breaks up with him, but then Hardin like releases the book and it's a major hit and he low key becomes a famous author. Now we have the final film, after everything. Hardin's publisher wants him to write a second book after the success of the first book, but he's having like a major writer's block moment. So he decides to go to Portugal randomly. And he goes and finds this girl named Natalie who he has a lot of history with. I don't exactly know why he went and sought out Natalie specifically. Who fucking knows? In the past, when he was living in London, he made a bet with his friends that he could hook up with Natalie and for proof, he recorded, you know, the whole thing. And this recording ended up being spread around and it hurt Natalie so badly that she had to leave town. During this trip, not much happened, honestly. He and Natalie made up, they went to the beach, went cliff jumping, went partying, went sailing. Hardin went to jail briefly um, for getting into a fight with someone and Vance had to bust him out. But this whole charade cured his writers block he wrote about Natalie in his second book and asked for her permission before publishing. Wow, he grew! Then Tessa and Hardin reunite at Landon's wedding at the end of the film. And during the reception, after having not seen each other for the past two years, Hardin immediately gets down on one knee and proposes and she says yes. The final scene of the film shows their happily ever after with them and their children. There was this whole minor plot line about Tessa being infertile, so glad they got that sorted out. As an outsider, with no knowledge of the books whatsoever, the ending felt very odd and unintuitive because it's stupid. You have four movies detailing the intricacies of Tessa and Hardin's relationship, the ups and downs, mostly downs. To have the fifth and final movie, the grand finale, be Hardin gallivanting through Portugal for no discernible reason, where Tessa literally isn't in the movie until the last 10 minutes, it's insulting, even for this franchise. It's such a weird choice that I ended up doing some digging to see what the fuck happened. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that there are four main after books. So Tessa and Hardin's story was supposed to wrap up in After Ever Happy, which would make sense given the title of that book, but it didn't in the movie series. Sometimes when doing adaptations, the choice is made to split up the final book into two different movies. And we've seen that in like Twilight Breaking Dawn parts one and two, and with The Hunger Games Mockingjay parts one and two. And usually that's because there's so much material to cover, but with After Everything, 
it seems to have deviated from the original plot, like, so much so that it seems pointless. Like, it wasn't a continuation of the story, it was a deviation. Which begs the question, whose decision was it to make a fifth movie? Was the Portugal storyline always the plan? Because I kind of find that hard to believe. What happened with Tessa's actress? Did she choose not to partake in the movie because of the storyline? Or was she written out? Or was there something else that was going on behind the scenes? In my eyes, like, really, there's only two possibilities. Either something came up and they had to scramble and create this mess, or this was always the plan in the beginning, thus it was a blatant cash grab. And also, okay, you make the decision to have the fifth movie only focus on Harden. Then how do you have the audacity to make every single major promotional post for this movie tease Tessa and Harden's wedding? What wedding? There was no wedding for them. Maybe this whole Harden solo thing could have worked for one of the middle movies of this series, but for this to be the finale is wild. The entire movie was legitimately pointless. You could have slapped the last 10 minutes of After Everything and put it onto the fourth movie and it would have made zero fucking difference. Fans of the series are understandably upset, but it's hard because you want to direct your anger at someone, but we have no way of knowing who is responsible for this choice or what's going on behind the scenes. The author, Anna Todd, has not been involved with the making of the movies since the second one when it peaked and then from there, uh, director Castile Landon has directed the last three films. But even still, who knows who's running the show? But it's sad because now that this movie has been made and put out there, this is the official ending. And that sucks. But don't worry because apparently a movie about Hardin when he was a teen before Tessa and also a different movie about Tessa and Hardin's kids, those two uh, movies have been announced. A prequel and a sequel. So there's that. So let me know what you think. Let me know what your thoughts are. As always, I hope you enjoyed coming on this journey with me and I will see y'all next time. Bye.